first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to come and, and talk, talk with you. And congratulations on what I think is an absolutely outstanding project. I think you should all be extremely proud of what you've achieved over the lifetime of the project. And my real hope is that it will be a long-lasting legacy for Europe going forward. Um, on June the 24th, like many, many of us in the United Kingdom, I woke up to a, in a state of, of horror and disbelief. I mean, it's fair to say that, that the outcome of the U UK referendum was one that I, like many in UK universities, didn't want, we didn't expect, and we didn't welcome. Our institutions are international, our networks are international, our faculty are international, our students are international, our outlook and our identities are international. We are part of a European community of scholars, a global community of scholars, for whom the flow of ideas, the flow of scholarship, the flow of scholars can and must know no borders. And for us in the university sector in the UK, you all need to know that nothing changed on the 24th of June in that respect. However, in truth, everything has changed because we saw finally and very, very clearly that we are a deeply divided country. What we witnessed was a protest vote from those caught on the wrong side of an increasingly polarized society who feel that they've been let down by their institutions, including so many of our elite universities, including my own. Institutions which remain gloriously out of touch with so many and the views of so many. Most of us simply didn't think it was going to happen. That it could happen, but it did. And now we have to ask, what does that mean for us, for our institutions of learning, for our institutions of science, technology and innovation, for responsible research and innovation, both in the UK and in Europe? Now, as many of you know, I've always been interested in innovation and technovisionary science leading to this as activities that, although rooted in the historical context, are profoundly future orientated in nature. Um, science and innovation, I've always argued, have a unique ability to create futures in sometimes banal and sometimes very profound ways. And I've always been interested in how we take responsibility for those futures through the collective steward of in stewardship of innovation and science leading to this in the present. And many of you know that I've, I've always believed the first and most important question for RRI is not what are the risks, that's a very important question, but what kind of future do we want research and innovation to create for the world and to create for Europe? That has to be the departure point for RRI. And in a world where science as the objective search for truth has become progressively replaced by science as the political search for value creation, I think that's a critically important question to keep asking. And so the responsible innovation framework that I and others developed was anchored in a conceptualization of responsibility that's future orientated. But in reality, I really wanted to start to know how people relate to the future. How do they engage with the future? And how do they engage with innov innovation that creates futures? So I began to ask just how do we and how should we engage with the future such that our institutions can steward science and innovation to futures that are desirable, that are equitable, and fundamentally good for all and good for our planet. I was interested in how different age groups and cultures engage with the future, and I began some discussions with social scientists working with children in some of the most deprived communities in South Wales, ex-mining communities, asking how do they envisage their future? How do they relate to the future? And what, what the researchers told me shocked me and gave me a real reality check, because they said to me, Richard, these children don't believe they have a future or ever will have a future. They live in the now from day to day. They're not like your children who see a future from school to university and to, and to a life thereafter. They've given up on the future and the power of innovation or any kind of institution to change it for them. Gloriously out of touch. And the UK referendum tragically told us that this isn't just a problem for children in the ex-mining communities of South Wales. This is a problem for vast and increasing swathes of our country and vast and increasing swathes of Europe. If we're going to be responsible about the, future, about the future and develop capacities for innovation to be responsible towards that future, we can't rem continue to let innovation be out of touch. This is not just an issue for the UK, but for us all. So what can we do? As you may recall, I and, I and others developed four process, 
Dimensions for Responsible Research and Innovation, which asked us to develop capacities for reflexivity, for anticipation, for inclusion, and for responsiveness. Now, I've talked a little bit about inclusion. I, I want to touch on the dimension of reflexivity, and I'm going to tell you a, a short story. I recently had a, a PhD student that investigates how financial innovation occurs in, in, in banks and other institutions. And what she found was that there are, in fact, incredibly well-developed processes of anticipation, of reflection. She found quite, quite good processes of inclusion, even though the configuration of stakeholder engagement was quite narrow. And she found very well-established processes of governance and responsiveness. However, there was no second-order reflexivity. What do I mean by that? They didn't question the purpose of finance as society, values such as making money with money, norms, our political economy. They were a given. And those are exactly the things that our people in the United Kingdom were protesting against. They were holding a mirror up to our governments and to ourselves and saying, this is not right and it has to change. They didn't quite know why or what, but they were protesting against the institutions that perpetuate a, a society that is not reflexive in that sense. And it's, a, it's in that current political economy that science and innovation hold a very special place. And the tragedy, I think, is that notwithstanding appeals to social innovation or to innovation aimed at grand challenges or inclusive innovation, the word and meaning of innovation is itself intimately and overwhelmingly tied to a political economy based on free markets, on competitive destruction, on entrepreneurialism, on the creation of value, on consumption, on never-ending growth, and on social polarization in which many feel left out. It's an Olympic Games where what counts is not participating, but winning through innovation. And we are all locked in. So, will RRI be a toolbox or an engine that is tuned to lead us to a future that is ultimately unsustainable, ecologically, socially, one that is increasingly polarized and increasingly in which the, the ones that are on the wrong side of the fence lose trust in us as institutions? Or will it be grand enough in its ambition to open up spaces to challenge our political economy, to ask the questions and to ensure those questions are responded to? Surely it has to. And so I'd just like to finish by saying that what we can do is learn from other worldviews in which innovation and science are implicated. Ideas that I focus on a dimension that I think we need to introduce into an RIA framework, which is the dimension of transition. We can learn from discourses of transition, like Buen Vivir in South America, the People's Science Movement in India, or the degrowth movement. They're minority voices, voices in the shadows of hegemony, and I don't particularly advocate any one of them, but I simply suggest that they offer new perspectives, new mental models for a different, more sustainable future that RRI must bring into the frame. So, where do we need RRI to go next? Firstly, I think we need to maintain and enrich the discourse and the community that it's developed including you. The people are what are important. Through FP7 and Horizon 2020, you and others have developed a community of people who need to be sustained. 19 hubs, 100 members, 29 countries. We need to sustain this community. We need to move probably from organized act into organized advocacy and possibly even activism. And secondly, I suggest we need to move not only from risk to innovation governance, but we fundamentally need to reframe innovation and its meaning. We need to encourage and, I suggest, take seriously worldviews that come from other parts of the globe and that offer different normative frames. As I said, in doing so, I think we need to go beyond responsiveness and introduce the dimension of transition. And that's going to need political commitment and political will. We've developed the rationale, the framing, the tools, the guidance, the means. Now we need the political will to change our institutions, the cultures, the governance and decision-making structures of our key research and innovation institutions and those who advise them. So where is the political will? In order to achieve this, you and I are going to have to be far more assertive, far more transformative, far more political. This cannot be a, simply a research project. We may need to become, as I say, RRI activists. So, can RRI reframe innovation and in doing so reframe our political economy? Can, as Giuseppe said, RRI lead to a change in mindset in our European society? Can it lead to change and to transition? I think that's the point that we are at now. 
in a world with a fragile future in which societal change must come if we are to survive and flourish, I think this could be one of RRI's greatest challenges, but one of its greatest opportunities. Thank you.